Jen. Hey, Vanessa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you uh, allow my video to be played, please? Oh my goodness, yes, of course. Yeah. That would be helpful, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> there we go. All right, I don't know what song's playing next because I have a million and one tabs open on my computer. So. <laughs> I was just trying to like shut down my email and try to figure out like how to. All right, Vanessa. <laughs> change it? No, I don't think you should. I haven't heard this song in years. <laughs> Come on. Exactly you remember what I mean putting it on the now. TV and seeing the Soul Tray line coming down? What was that one show called? <laughs> it was Solid Gold, whatever it was. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know, I was just thinking, like, what's Maureen gonna, I bet she would dance to it. My life goals is to get Maureen on the dance floor somewhere.
you don't like any of these, you just gotta be like, next. I can get down with just about anything, Vanessa. Okay. Awesome to see Maureen breaking it down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it sure will, Darla. <laughs> She's got some moves. Morning, Rachel. How are you? Hey there. Good morning. I'm well. Thanks. How about you? We're doing all right. Thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah, sure thing. Sorry, I know I'm not super early. I was going through my inbox trying to find the link. And same, like, same. And then I clicked on the pre-college one for this afternoon and I'm like, why isn't it letting me in? And I'm like, oh yeah, get in the right one. Um, we're still waiting on Maureen here morning, for a second. Okay. okay, great. Thanks. Um, and can you remind me, is this the pre-college group? This is the college group that we're the college group. Okay, I'm going to touch on like, basically the same thing, just kind of an overview of the changes um, that passed last year, but just good to, I, I couldn't remember which one was which. <clears throat> yeah, I think we are recording this one too, so we can play it for our pre-college group this afternoon as well, so. Um. Okay, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the three o'clock one? <clears throat> yeah, were you going to be there for that one? I think I'm Sorry, I'm gonna drink some water. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna be there for that one. Yes. Okay. Never mind then. We won't have um, to. But I think she said, I think Angelica had said that you all were recording for one to, yes, so you could play it for one next month, maybe. Yeah, actually on Friday. You're right. That's what we're supposed to do. Great. Okay. 
So Vanessa, Rachel is going to be with us this afternoon, but we're recording her sessions today so that she can, we can play them on Friday. Sounds good. I'm going to stop share if you want to go ahead and bring up your. Oh, I do. And Maureen is getting on. Um, I need, you've disabled my participant screen sharing as well. What is wrong with all of my settings? Yeah. They were tricky yesterday in a webinar too. Um, all panelists. Okay, go ahead and try again. Gracias. I got gotcha. you. How are you, Rachel? I am doing well. Doing well. Glad to be with you all. All right. And should we be off video when we're, is that until presenting? I don't know what you all. Yeah. I mean, it's up to you, um, but you know, usually I'll go away because <laughs> I'm just in the background, but Jen might still be up while Maureen is talking. So it's really up to you. Okay, great. I'll probably hop off. And um, I think maybe Angelica had mentioned this when we talked, but I'm, I'll probably talk for 15-ish minutes and then um, leave time for questions. So I don't know like what that process looks like or what, what typically works best for you all. Sure, I can, I'll monitor the Q&A box. So this morning I'll make an announcement that we'll have all the questions go into the Q&A box um, and I can monitor that and I can read them to you if that's what you like. I can kind of go through them and, and read them out after you're done with your presentation. Sure, yeah, that might be easiest. And I, I'm also happy to like share slides and, and follow up with folks later. Um, oh, I'm right, um, Vanessa, Ra Rachel needs screen sharing too. So I sh you sh all should have um, screen share capabilities. Do you want to try, Rachel? Sure, I can. It says this will stop. Others. Yeah, I'll stop share real quick. Good morning, Maureen. Good morning. Hi, Rachel. Hey there. Hi, everybody. You are here. I, I went running to your office and I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was down with Kim. Oh, OK. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah, it works. OK, great. So Vanessa, are you uh, opening this up? Uh, Jen has it up. Jen okay. is, Jen is perfect. Cool. I am right. ready. Let me know if you need. Appreciate you, Vanessa. Thank you. Are we ready to get started, Maureen? It's 11.02. Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We are here today for our College Connect Discuss and Learn. We're excited to have you here. Um, unfortunately, our colleague Angelica couldn't be with us today. She had to take the day off, um, but we are joined by Rachel Gentry, who we'll introduce in a little bit, and of course, the fabulous Maureen Hoyler. Thanks to Vanessa for getting us set up. Um, today we are, oh, and I'm Jen Rudolph, sorry, Director of uh, uh, Pre-College and State Initiatives at the Council. Um, today we are going to cover a lot of things. So we're going to move through our agenda talking about the FAFSA first. We're going to get an update on the Department of Education and their new leadership from our President Maureen Hoyler. We're going to talk a little bit about the EOC and talent search competitions. We're going to talk a little bit about the McNair upcoming competition. It's not too soon to start thinking about that, folks. Um, SSS Grant Aid made the agenda today. We're gonna talk a little bit about McNair stipends. And then of course, we'll have any time for question and answer at the end. And without further ado, we'll get started. So I have the pleasure of introducing Rachel Gentry. She's the Assistant Director of Federal Relations at the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. She contributes to their policy and advocacy efforts, representing the association before congressional members and staff as and working to enhance the advocacy capacity of its members. Running NASFAA, that's a lot of letters there, Rachel worked in higher education policy analysis and research at the Institute for Higher Education Policy and Center for American Progress. She began her career in higher education as a college advisor with the Carolina College Advising Corps, where she worked with two public high schools in North Carolina, assisting low-income and first-generation students navigating the college application and financial aid process. Rachel holds a master's degree in higher education from the University of Maryland College Park and bachelor's degree in public policy and psychology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We are so excited to have her with us today. I will ask um, before she speaks that you all put your um, questions in the Q&A box. Rachel will be taking questions after this. Rachel, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can share your slides. 
So questions in the Q&A box, chat in the chat box, and Rachel, I'll, uh, you let me know when you're ready for questions and I'll ask them for you at the end. Great, that sounds wonderful. Thanks so much, Jen. Let me just make sure I've got my screens all set up. All right, well, again, thank you, Jen, and thanks so much um, to you all for having me today. I'm looking forward to, to the conversation and sharing a little bit about um, some of the, the recent changes related to the FAFSA and needs analysis that um, we saw coming out of the bill last year. Um, just on a personal note, um, I, as Jen mentioned, I came into this world through um, college access work and just really appreciate the work that you all do always, but especially this past year, um, and more than ever, you, the work that you all are doing is, is just critical to student success. So I'm really excited to be able to share some new information with you all today. Um, so I'm gonna be discussing um, the bill that passed in December of 2020. Um, so I'll kind of go through um, setting the stage for that bill, talking through what, that, um, what the changes to the FAFSA will look like, changes to the federal methodology and the need analysis process, um, just to kind of give you all an idea of, you know, once this bill is implemented, um, what, what does this really mean for you and for the students that you serve? Um, so the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 um, was the bill that was the fiscal year 2021 omnibus, which really just means it included all of the, um, the, the government spending for fiscal year 2021. It included COVID relief, and then it also contained a number of higher education and student aid related provisions that will bring some pretty substantial changes to need analysis and you know, thus the overall FAFSA completion experience for your students. Um, so the, the bill incorporated elements of Senator Alexander's previous FAFSA simplification. So um, FAFSA simplification is an issue that was really important to Senator Alexander and sort of one of his um, like legacy issues. And so um, you know, at the end of last year, we saw this, this bill finally pass, which is really exciting. Um, and and also we something that we supported for a long time. So we're excited to, to see the changes pass as well. Um, the large majority of the changes in the bill will not go into effect until the 2023-24 award year. So I just want to give that caveat that we do have some time before these, you know, we'll actually see these, these changes be put into put into place. Um, and the bill also built on the Future Act, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So um, I guess before I kind of get into the details, as you all know all too well, financial aid is a very complex and technical world. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of give a, a relatively high level overview. Um, we'll get a little bit into the weeds, but I'm happy to dive deeper, answer questions that you all may have um, once we get through the slides. All right. So um, before diving into the details of the new bill, I did wanna to touch briefly on some previous legislation that sort of set the stage for the changes that passed at the end of last year. You all may recall that back in December of 2019, the Future Act was passed. So in addition to providing um, $255 million in annual permanent funding for HBCUs and MSIs, the Future Act also allowed for direct cross-agency data sharing between the IRS and the Department of Education. So what that means is that essentially once fully implemented, the Future Act will allow for the process of importing tax information onto a student's FAFSA to be much more seamless than it currently is. So students won't have to go through the sort of clunky two-step process that they currently do with the data retrieval tool. Um, there are students who currently can't use the data retrieval tool who, tool who will be able to, to directly import their tax information once the future act is implemented. Um, and you know, there will also be information such as non-filing status that will be included in the data transfer. So that will really be helpful to a lot of students who right now are having to go through a much more manual process. Um, so you know, the Future Act data, sh and data sharing and this new legislation are really meant to work hand in hand to provide you know, overall a more, more streamlined, um, less manual FAFSA filing process for students. So, Wanted to mention that before we get into um, the most recent changes that passed because that, I think that is important to keep in mind that um, in addition to the changes that are that passed back in December, we're going to be seeing another big change when the Future Act is implemented um, in terms of pulling over the students' tax information into the FAFSA. So now getting into some of the changes that were included in the bill at the end of last year. Um, so I'll kind of start talking through what will look different on the FAFSA and then move into the changes around the need analysis formula and determination of Pell Grant eligibility. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to caveat that these changes for the most part won't be implemented until the FAFSA for the 23-24 academic year, um, which will come out in October of 2022. So um, there's still a lot to be determined um, in terms of implementation, but we've got some time to you know, learn more about the changes and prepare students and families um, for, what, the, for you know, what, what this will look like moving forward. Um, so at a high level, the FAFSA simplification changes are expected to reduce the number of questions on the FAFSA for most students and families, um, especially those who are low income. So the number of questions will vary depending on the applicant, um, but it's been estimated that the number of questions may go from around currently around 108 down to as low as 36 questions. Um, additionally, all of the questions on untaxed income will be, asked, will be asking for items that are included on the federal tax return. Um, so what that means is that any untaxed income questions, any of that data will be able to be pulled directly over from the IRS rather than students having to manually enter that tax information um, as they currently do. Um, the questions on drug convictions and selective service registration that are tied to Title IV eligibility will be eliminated, which is a really exciting um, development. We at NASA have been pushing for this for a long time to both remove the questions as well as remove you know, the eligibility requirement um, related to those questions. So that's definitely a big win for students. Um, I remember when I was co doing college access work that those questions were, were definitely ones that were challenging for some students and took a lot to resolve. So um, that's gonna be a really great change that we think will help a lot of students. And then finally, there will be no asset questions for recipients of means-tested benefits, as well as those with adjusted, an adjusted gross income of under $60,000 and who file you know, more simple tax returns. So um, your lowest income students <clears throat> are not going to be required to provide additional asset information. So getting a little into the weeds a little bit more, um, and I'm going to touch on some of the big changes to the need analysis formula, um, which is you know essentially the formula that now calculates estimated family contribution um, as well as Pell eligibility. So one of the biggest changes that I think got a lot of attention when this bill passed is that the current EFC expected family contribution will be renamed um, and replaced with the student aid index. Um, as I've kind of already started going through and, and we'll continue to get into, um, the bill you know, does make changes to the calculation and to the, the federal methodology formula, um, but renaming, you know, the, the SAI I think is largely just a new name for the EFC. Um, and it's sort of an acknowledgement that the, the EFC term doesn't really properly characterize what is in fact, you know, what families are able to contribute. It's, it's been a term that's been um, confusing to students and families, and it's not really a reflection of what a family can or will pay for their, their college expenses. So um, the student aid index is sort of an effort to rename that and, and make it a little bit more clear. So the SAI or the renamed EFC will determine eligibility for all Title IV aid, except for the minimum and the maximum Pell Grant award. So SAI will still determine eligibility for federal work study, for SEOG, for direct loans. Um, the SAI, the bill included a provision that the SAI or the renamed DFC can go as low as negative 1500. So that's a change because currently um, zero is the lowest that a student's EFC can go. Um, the bill does include provisions that direct loans and Pell Grants cannot exceed the cost of attendance. Um, but the negative SAI establishes a framework that will allow schools to um, sort of identify the neediest students. Um, so right now there are lots of students who have a zero EFC and sometimes it can be difficult for institutions or states who have their own aid programs to kind of differentiate between that large group of zero EFC students. Um, so uh, the negative figure will, will prove helpful by breaking up that sort of artificial cluster of zero EFCs to differentiate between um, the neediest students within that group. Um, so we think that's a, it's gonna be a good move to allow states and institutions to more accurately target need-based aid, such as um, SEOG or, or their own programs. Um, and then lastly, um, the changes, and I'll get into this a bit more on the next slide around Pell, Pell Grant eligibility, but um, overall the changes will allow for better predictability um, of Pell eligibility through the creation of a Pell lookup table. So I'll 
explain that a little bit more as I get into the next slides. Um, so as I mentioned, the Student Aid Index, or SAI, um, determines eligibility for all Title IV except the maximum and the minimum Pell Grant awards. So I'm going to kind of give an overview of, of how Pell will be calculated um, once these changes are all implemented. So a student will be first be considered for maximum Pell. So that will be based on an, um, the number of parents in their household and their family income as a percentage of um, the federal poverty level for, their, for the applicant's household size. And so on this next slide, um, this is the list of criteria for a student to automatically qualify for maximum Pell. So if they meet any of these criteria, a student would qualify for maximum Pell, assuming they're you know, otherwise eligible, Title IV eligible. Um, students who meet these criteria and are eligible for max Pell will also automatically have a SAI or the renamed DFC of zero. And um, students who are independent students who are tax non-filers or dependent children of non-filing parents, their um, EFC will automatically be negative 1500, which again is that, that low, the lowest it can now go. So once a student um, is, um, once a student is sort of evaluated to see if they meet any of those criteria on the last slide, um, that, would, that would make them eligible for maximum Pell. Um, the student would then, um, if they don't meet any of those, any of the qualification for maximum Pell, the student would then be evaluated um, based on a, the, a formula that's very, pretty much the same as, a, as our current system. Um, so these are going to be your students who don't receive max Pell, but are going to re are receiving some amount of Pell grant, but just less, lower than the maximum. So that would be determined um, by subtracting the student's student aid index, their, the renamed BFC from the maximum Pell amount. Um, max Pell minus SAI equals their Pell amount. That's very similar to, to the current the system that we currently have. Um, and again, so students would first be considered for max Pell based on the criteria on the previous slide. If they don't um, receive max Pell, they'd be evaluated for this, a partial Pell through the, the formula that, that looks very similar to our current formula. If a student doesn't meet any of the criteria for the maximum award, and they also don't receive a partial Pell Grant award through subtracting their SAI from the maximum Pell amount, um, a student could still receive the minimum Pell award um, if their income or parent income falls below a set percentage of the poverty line. So this is number three on this slide. So essentially what will happen is first students will be evaluated for max Pell if they don't meet any of those requirements, they'll be evaluated for a partial Pell Grant. And then assuming students meet, a student doesn't meet either of those, um, doesn't receive a Pell through either of those methods, they'll be evaluated to see if they might qualify for the minimum Pell Grant. So what does all of this mean? Um, I know that some of these changes, especially around the, the SAI calculation and the Pell Grant determination might seem you know, really confusing and intimidating and just really different. Um, but I, something I always try to note um, when I give these presentations is that most of these changes are going to be on the back end. They're going, you know, really just impacting the kind of behind the scenes process and the calculation that goes on after a student submits a FAFSA. So these changes aren't going to be, you know, making the process more complicated for students or impacting their experience as an applicant when completing the FAFSA. Um, it's really impacting what happens after they submit the FAFSA um, to kind of determine their, their SAI and, and their Pell eligibility. Um, and in fact, you know, these changes will actually simplify the FAFSA for students and make Pell eligibility easier to understand. So um, I think that kind of gets at this first bullet is that for all students, but especially low-income students, the FAFSA will be shorter, simpler, and easier to complete. Secondly, Pell eligibility will be more predictable. So I mentioned earlier that the bill allows for the creation of a Pell lookup table. And what that means is because um, there are set criteria for maximum, um, set criteria for a student to receive maximum Pell Grant, um, which again was, was is sort of calculated through number of parents, um, adjusted gross income relative to poverty level, because that those criteria are, are already set, um, it's, it will be possible for a student um, 
even before they apply, before they complete a FAFSA, just knowing those few pieces of information, knowing um, you know their, their annual family income, knowing the number of people in their household, they will be able to look at this table and have a general idea of what amount of Pell Grant they might be eligible for. Um, the same goes for the minimum Pell Award. So um, that was a big part. Um, I think a big one of Senator Alexander's big motivations um, as he was working on this issue was wanting to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and allow students to, to look in advance and say like, will I be eligible for a Pell Grant and have a general sense of whether or not they, they will be. So um, for you all, I think as, as folks that are working with um, students and supporting students through this process, that I hope will be very helpful um, because you'll be able to sit down with students and, and say, you know, based on your family income, based on your family composition, you might be eligible for a Pell Grant of this amount because we're looking at this table that's right in front of us. Um, and then lastly, what does this mean? So the changes to need analysis and Pell determination um, will result in more students becoming Pell eligible and more students receiving the maximum award, which I think, you know, overall is, is one of the biggest wins for this legislation. So um, an estimated 93% of families with incomes below $40,000 will receive a maximum Pell Grant, and that is up from 78% currently. An estimated 48% of families with incomes between $40,000 and $70,000 will receive some amount of Pell Grant, and that's up from 14% in that income range currently. And then overall, more than half a million families will gain Pell eligibility, and 1.7 million additional students will receive the maximum award. So um, I think really that those last data points um, is, is what we're probably most excited about at NASA is, is seeing an expansion of Pell eligibility because of those changes to the need analysis and into the, the Pell determination, um, in addition to the simplification of the FAFSA. So this slide, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we do have this on our website and it kind of is a, a little bit of a concept map that, that demonstrates um, Kind of how a student would move through the federal methodology and and Pell eligibility determination. Um, as I mentioned, these are all back end changes. So this was really developed to help you all or help financial aid administrators visualize kind of how eligibility for Pell grants works. Um, but this is again not something that reflects the applicant's experience, the student experience, or actual FAFSA questions. But that's on our website if if you're interested in in seeing this in more detail. So when will these changes take effect? Most of the bills, um, the bills changes will be effective on July 1, 2023, um, which is for award year, and for award year 2023-24. Um, the 23-24 FAFSA will become available on October 1, 2022. And I think it's also important to note that ideally, implementation of these changes will align with implementation of the Future Act, which is the bill that allows for the direct data sharing between the IRS and the Department of Education. So ideally we'll see both of these, you know, big pieces of legislation that will impact um, the FAFSA and student experience with the FAFSA implemented together and simultaneously. So that um, sort of just one, one change over one year. Um, there's a lot kind of to be determined around the implementation of both of these bills, but ideally they'll, they'll be happening in tandem. Um, I did want to note that the removal of the questions on selective service registration and drug convictions do have an early implementation option. So um, the secretary, if, if they decide to do so, um, could implement um, removing those questions before July 1 of 2023, um, at, you know, removing the questions and their tied eligibility. So um, we're kind of waiting to see what, what that might look like. Um, and then briefly, I wanted to touch on a few additional higher education provisions that were included in the bill. Um, I already touched on the drug convictions and selective service, but another, I think a really big one for the aid community and for you all um, is the changes to the subsidized usage limit, um, SULA. Um, so the bill repeals the SULA requirement, um, which currently bars students from receiving subsidized direct loans for more than 150% of the published length of their program. Um, and so that's a really big win for students because it's just removing the cap on the amount of time they're eligible for LENS. Um, and you know that's something that we've been supportive of for a long time and we think will really, really help a lot of students. So we're excited to see that. Um, and the bill also in restores Pell Grant eligibility for incarcerated students who are currently um, prohibited from accessing Pell Grants. Um, so that's another something that we've been supportive of and are really excited to see um, and feel that it's an important step towards expanding post-secondary access for incarcerated students. 
Um, the bill also includes changes to how schools estimate cost of attendance, some modifications to the professional judgment process, um, loan forgiveness for HBCU capital financing loans, and FAFSA data sharing. And then um, the last thing I wanted to, to touch on is um, some provisions around provisional independent status. So the bill includes a section that um, allows otherwise independent students to complete the FAFSA as a provisional independent student if the student believes that they might qualify um, for an independent student, student status due to an unusual situation in their family. Um, and I imagine many of you may have worked with students who have gone through the process of um, a dependency override. So after completing the FAFSA, um, a student who feels that they might qualify for an in independent student status um, would receive an estimate of their federal Pell Grant award and other information based on um, independent status. In turn, financial aid administrators will be required to notify these students of the institution's process and their requirements and their timeline around um, adjust adjustments through the professional judgment process. Um, if the student wanted to go through the process of requesting professional judgment for a dependency override. Um, so I think that's you know, something important for you all to keep in mind um, as you're helping students with the FAFSA. So I will stop there. I know that's a lot of information. Um, I'm happy to take questions on any of this um, and we'll do my best to answer or get you the information. And this is my contact information as well. If I can ever, um, I or anyone at NASA can ever be helpful to you all, we're, we always wanna be available. So thank you again for, for the time and I'll look forward to your questions. Great information, Rachel. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go through the Q&A box again if folks could put their um, questions in the Q&A box. I will read them for Ms. Rachel. Ms. Rachel, what are means-tested benefits? That's a great question. So means-tested benefits are things like SNAP. Um, so you know, food stamps, as they're often called, um, supplemental security income, um, any type of benefits that um, families or individuals are usually have to apply for with the federal government um, that are related to income. Um, and so it's a lot of the sort of social support programs, things like Medicaid. Um, and so a lot of the, um, the thinking behind including that as part of the FAFSA you know, process and the methodology is that if a, you know, if a family is receiving SNAP or if a family is receiving Medicaid, they've likely already gone through the process of providing documentation and that demonstrates their financial need. And so um, that's sort of a way integrating that into the FAFSA is, is, is essentially not asking low-income families to continually prove and provide documentation that demonstrates that they are in need of financial assistance. Awesome, thank you. Um, we got a couple of questions that started out with, this might not be a question for Rachel, but so maybe Maureen, you can help. Why, why don't I take uh, the, at least make the judgment, okay. Okay, that um, sounds good. No, we don't so, know when the new low income guidelines are going to be published. Um, in terms of the question is, um, are there any initiatives for making TRIO income eligible equal to Pell eligible? Yes, you may know that um, COE's reauthorization recommendations do um, for student support services in McNair um, ask that be that being Pell eligible is sufficient to document low income status. You would still have to document first generation status. However, this the current definition of low income is in the Higher Education Act, and so until there's a reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Um, it, we don't believe there's a way to initiate, to have this happen, but this is very, very, very high on our priority list. Um, and, and we're trying to, uh, to get this done. Um, is there a resource we can use to refer to these changes in FAFSA? Uh, Rachel, we can share these slides with everybody that's on the webinar, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can share the slides and then I can also share with the COE team, we have a whole web center on our website that's dedicated to this bill and kind of unpacking all of the, the changes. Um, and so that we also have like a podcast that where we get into some of the changes. Um, so I can send that link as well. And um, all those resources are open to the public and, and you all can 
spend as much time as you'd like digging into the details. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Another question. Can you repeat the number of questions currently in uh, the fast fund and the expectation both for low income Pell, uh, full Pell recipients and for others that would be in the updated FAFSA? Yeah, so I do think this is, it's a little tricky to answer because it, there's been different numbers cited and it really depends on, um, it really depends on the student and with like the current skip logic, the numbers currently not the same for all students, but what you've, what I've heard the most is there's 108 currently and it will, could go down to as low as 36. But again, it will really depend on the student um, their financial situation and the questions that they're required to provide. But I think something that's important to note is, at least when I was in, in the college access space, the most challenging questions on the FAFSA were the financial ones and the tax ones. And I remember sitting down with students and going through their tax returns line by line and importing the information. And once we see the new changes and the future act implemented, those questions should largely be automatically pulled over from the IRS. So um, it will just be a lot easier. So, you know, 30, mid 30s is what I've heard, but it, again, it will really depend on the specific student. And one more question is, will, uh, will prisoners in traditional prison systems be eligible for Pell? Not just it, it, uh, individuals that are in transitional or halfway housing. Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, Yes, yeah, so the bill restores Pell Grant eligibility for incarcerated students um, in in correctional in, in prisons and um, in the bill. And we also this is also on the web page I mentioned earlier. It goes into kind of definition of um, of incarcerated students. And it, but it, it, we were excited that there weren't any specific you know carve outs for certain populations of incarcerated students. So. Um, it will really you know, restore access for millions of students across the country. Um, there's a question about, is there gonna be more money? Um, there are certainly getting more money into Pell. In fact, doubling Pell was in the, um, it was in the democratic platform, doubling Pell and doubling Trio. This is, it, it was not, there was no more money for Pell in, um, in the bill that we're discussing right now, but it is a, high priority, I'm sure for NASPA, and it's a high priority for COE, and it's yeah. a high priority uh, for, for many um, across the board. I'd like, Rachel, to ask you one more question. Verification has been a big problem for many low-income students, and uh, low-income students seem to be overrepresented in uh, those that are verified. Now, some of this transfer data from IRS should eliminate the need for verification in many instances, but is that a priority for NASFA too, to reduce the number of, of low-income students that, that require verification immediately? It seems like something that administration could do quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Verification is a huge priority for us, both on the student side for all the reasons you just mentioned, Maureen, as well as on the, the institutional side and on, you know, for you all as practitioners, um, we know it, in addition to being incredibly challenging and burdensome to students, it also takes a lot of time from folks that are on campuses that otherwise could be supporting students through counseling or academic support and, and have to spend a lot of time helping kind of helping students navigate that process. So it's, yeah, it's a huge priority for us. Um, we do think that the changes, particularly the, the future act will, will help with the, um, with the verification of tax information because right now, because due to the data retrieval tool sort of being this two-step process, um, not all of the tax information that's on the FAFSA that's imported is considered verified, but once there's sort of a direct line between the IRS and the Department of Education, all of that tax information will be considered already verified um, when a student submits their FAFSA. So that that's a big win. Um, and we also, yeah, we've, you know, I think it's been one of our top priorities is pushing for um, more transparency around verification and, you um, finding ways to alleviate the burden that it places, um, which we know is disproportionately put onto low-income students and students with, um, you know, what we might call a non-traditional background. 
um, our family structure. And that's, that's a top priority for us. Now, our experience and probably your experience too <laughs> has been that um, many financial aid offices have been reluctant to use professional judgment to allow a student to, to be an independent student rather than uh, including or requiring a parental information. I understand the Biden administration is encouraging um, and maybe I made this up. So if I'm not, I, I, I may have dreamt this rather than read it, um, is, is encouraging the use of professional judgment rather than, than holding it as something that if people use it, they'll have exposure for their institution. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Um, they're currently, I, it was sometime in January, I feel like January was so crazy. It's been a bit of a blur, but sometime last month, um, there was a, um, the department issued some guidance um, that essentially just sort of reminds financial aid administrators of their authority to use professional judgment and um, will make some adjustments to the kind of review process that surrounds um, like when institutions use PJ. Um, and it's um, ex you're exactly right, Maureen. It's sort of an effort to make sure that institutions aren't hesitant to perform what might look like more professional judgments than normal um, for fear of some type of repercussion um, because having such, they have such a drastic increase. Um, this was, there was very similar guidance issued in 2009 when during the recession, when we saw a lot, you know, kind of similar to now we had the high levels of unemployment um, lots of students whose families had experienced financial distress or changes in their financial situation. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that we've, that was, you know, coming in, one of the first things that we've communicated with the Biden administration um, is the importance of kind of re-upping that guidance to make sure that um, institutions are able and, and feel confident in using that authority to adjust a student's income if they or their, or their parents are, um, have, have lost a job and are receiving unemployment benefits. So um, the thing that comes to mind for me most often in terms of professional judgment is when a student's family or a, or a student's parent um, is unwilling to provide information and are unwilling to provide financial support to a student. Um, they're really left in the cold uh, and that a financial aid administrator can treat that student as an independent student. You've also indicated instances where the, the family's financial situation has changed a lot over the course of uh, recent months. Um, are there other instances that come to mind for you that, that financial aid administrators do use professional judgment? It, it kind of typical examples. Yeah, you know, I think that the income changes in income is is a big one, um, and receipt of you know unemployment benefits, and then I think the dependency overrides are another big one. I think the interesting thing about professional judgment is that, um, and something that we always remind folks of, you know, folks on the Hill, folks at the department, is the the reason professional judgment works is because it's handled on a case by case basis. Um, it's you know, it's student by student. It's meant to have. Um, it's a process that, that has some flexibility so that aid administrators can use their judgment to, to determine, you know, make an appropriate call um, based on the student situation. And so um, I think that those two buckets, sort of the, the dependency override because of a, a family situation or um, the change in income are, are probably the two most common. Um, but I'm sure if I had one of, you know, one of our members on, on the call with me, they could list a number of other very, you know, very specific situations that, um, that they ha experience, you know, every single year. Um, and they're, they all look really different. And we've really supported, you know, maintaining that authority um, because we've, it, it is important for a student who may have, you know, there may have, they may be the first student ever to be in that sort of situation. Um, and aid offices should have the the ability to use their discretion um, to make an appropriate call. Uh, we have one last question. Uh, and I think this is something that that, that many uh, in college opportunity programs see. A student's unable to 
either return to school or continue with the same institution because of an unpaid balance at, at an institution. When you think about how uh, a counselor should approach that situation, are there, are there things that they can think through to help that student get out of that situation? And so you're asking about enrolling at a different institution? In or even at the same one where they're not allowed to enroll because they, they have a balance due. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm not quite as familiar. I, I, I know what you're talking about. Um, I do think that it's like a lot of what I've said on the, on the, during our time is that it's very case by case. And I do think there, are, I think there is more, there has, you know, in recent years been more focus put on this issue. Um, I've heard a lot about it in the context of students who maybe have an unpaid balance at an, at an institution and are unable to access their transcript. Um, if they're trying to transfer or enroll at another institution and if they're unable to, to cover that balance, it kind of puts them in a, a really difficult situation because they also aren't able to get the information, get the transcript needed to, to move elsewhere. Um, so I, I know that this is something that I've heard discussed more. Um, I'd be interested in, in our chatting with our colleagues over at ACRO, which is the registrar. Um, I, I feel like I've heard um, some of their folks talking about this. So um, I, may, I may be able to look into that and can follow up on that one. Um, because I do think it's it's more of a institution by institution um, case, you know, case by case basis. And I think there um, are a lot of schools that are that are probably thinking about, especially given their current situation, are thinking about developing these, you know, policies, whether it's institutional forgiveness or or you know, flexibilities that would help these kinds of students um, be able to continue their education despite, um, you know, a previous unpaid balance that might otherwise be kind of getting in their way of moving forward. The last question had to do with um, an individual who was homeless. Um, can they be de declared independent? Again, this is a situation where if there's an assumption that the student is living at home and the student is not living at home, um, it, this is a professional judgment situation, is not able to live at home, is not. Um, so. Uh, many of those students that you you were having uh, have greater need than it comes in the in their first needs analysis can be uh, you can work with your financial aid office to yeah, see if really, they can use professional judgment. That's right. I'm really glad that this question was asked, and that's I should have mentioned that earlier. I think this is that's another group of students um, who professional judgment is is very common for. Um, and there were there were some um, there was were a couple of things included in this most recent bill around um, students experiencing homelessness and sort of the, the, the termination of their um, of, of their dependency status um, and their status as, as a student experiencing homelessness. And uh, another question, the individual understands that transcripts cannot be held due to an unpaid balance. Is that is that true? I'm going to be honest, I am not 100% sure on that. Um, I know, like I said, it's something I've heard, I feel like a few years ago, we talked about a lot, and, and there may have been some movement um, at, at either the state or federal level. So I'm, I'm, I'll look into that and we'll follow up because um, I don't want to give <laughs> incorrect information. And I, like I said, it's a little bit outside of my scope of what I really know a lot about. Um, and I know that, like I said, there's been a lot of attention on the issue and um, it's something I've heard about, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. So I'll, I'll definitely check on that and follow Thanks up. a lot. I think um, your presentation has been really, really great. And, but it also opens up um, the idea that we should probably involve some of your, your members answering some of the nitty gritty questions that, uh, and as you said, um, the registrars, some of the nitty gritty questions our, our constituents have. So we yeah, the really look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, thank you really very much for this. We really yeah, always happy. It. And like I said, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that our members are way smarter than I am, and they are the experts, and they are they're on the day to day. So I <laughs> just like you all, I'm sure. So I'm always happy to connect you all directly with with members. I'm sure a lot of you work with eight offices on your campuses. But um, thank you for having me. And um, if there's ever you know anything we can do, don't hesitate to reach out and. I've got a little homework. I'll, I'll, I'll do some research on some of these questions and we'll also um, share the resources I mentioned earlier. Thank you, you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Jen, back to you. <laughs> all right, let's pull up our PowerPoint here. And let's see, share. There we go. Thank you, Rachel. That was very informative. I want to move this little box out of the way here. There we go. All right, Maureen. I think you're up. Okay, so you get to listen to me for a little bit longer. Um, so we're so delighted in the next slide, please, um, that Michelle Asha Cooper, who formerly was uh, president of the Institute for Higher Education Policy, um, has been named Acting Assistant Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary um, for, well, it's Deputy Assistant Secretary um, for higher education programs and acting assistant secretary uh, for post-secondary education. If you want to put it in the context of the previous administration, um, Robert King was the assistant secretary and uh, Chris McGarren was the deputy assistant secretary. Uh, Michelle is a real, 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 real friend of TRIO. Um, and of low-income first-generation students. She, um, uh, she's worked with COE on a number, of, uh, a number of situations, and she always comes to the, the defense of TRIO programs and TRIO educate, ed, educators when, they, um, are, uh, when the efficacy of our work is questioned from the outside. So we couldn't be happier that uh, with this appointment, there's probably no one more attuned to TRIO uh, position to, to be an excellent um, Deputy Assistant Secretary or Assistant Secretary. Um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary does not require Senate confirmation. The Assistant Secretary requires Senate confirmation. The Biden administration has not named their nominee for assistant secretary. Once they name the nominee, then they have to go through a hearing in the, uh, before the help committee and confirmation by the full Senate. So it appears that uh, Dr. Cooper will be in the position of ass assistant secretary for at least the foreseeable future. So next slide, please. Um, it, is likely um, Dr. Bird Johnson is currently holds the position of senior advisor to the deputy assistant secretary. So um, she will continue to uh, carry much of the weight uh, for Dr. Cooper, given the dual responsibility that Dr. Cooper has. I'm, I'm going back to, to um, the platform of the Democratic Par Party, which came up in the, in, the, in the last presentation. The Democratic platform, which was adopted by the convention, says we will double the maximum Pell Grant award for low-income students and double federal support for TRIO programs that help first-generation college students, students with disability, veterans, and underrepresented students uh, apply to and complete college. Um, when you think about getting more money in the appropriation for TRIO, you can utilize that, that new money for two things. You can give existing programs more money or you can fund additional programs and you can do both. Um, because inflation is low, although a, a, a minimum, you know, one to 3% increase can be provided um, to existing programs um, without increasing the number of students big increases in, uh, you know, if you were going to take every grant and increase it by 
that would almost assuredly be tied to an agreement by the the institution to increase the number of students that they serve. Um, and many institutions, not all, are um, in a position in part for because of COVID, but in part because of size, that they're not able to increase the number of students they serve. And so funding new programs is is major that we and there's two ways that we could recommend to the Department of Education that they that if the Biden administration does make a major investment in TRIO, that they could use that money. One is to increase the money that are in existing programs. One is to increase the number of programs funded in the McNair and upward bound competitions because the first Biden budget will fund those competitions. And a, a third way is to fund down the slates in student support services, talent search and EOC. As most of you recall, um, the cutoff for new programs uh, in the last student support services was you could only lose two thirds of a point. And so um, the, the, there would have to be some, a, a small bit of legislative language added to an appropriations bill. But that is another way that this uh, promise made in the, in the democratic platform could be realized. Um, and I think um, I'm turning it over to you. Next slide, please. Alrighty, so um, just a brief update. The talent search competition is due, uh, grants are due February 26 to be submitted. Uh, obviously we encourage you not to wait until that day. Um, that is a Friday and then cheers to all of you the following Monday. The EOC competition is also due. So as all the advice that we always give, make sure you're planning ahead, make sure you're submitting early, do not get caught in that last minute um, submission trap. We did hear of unsuccessful SSS programs that just didn't get the doubled verification by the midnight deadline. So be sure that you're submitting these early if you are indeed applying for them. And then we do want to announce our upcoming proposal writing um, competition workshops. And we want to uh, talk to you about our forums um, that we are also presenting. So these registration is coming soon for these upper bound and upper bound math science will be doing a proposal writing workshop. Our first one is April 12th and 13th. And um, this is free for COE members. You're all here because you're COE members, but if your membership um, is going to expire, we encourage you to reach out to Alvin Phillips and make sure that'll be current for the April 12th and 13th proposal writing workshop. Uh, May 4th and 5th, we are gonna have an innovative forum. So that'll be a forum where we generate ideas. We do a lot of sharing. Um, that is at a cost 400 for members. Our first McNair proposal writing workshop is going to be at the beginning of May, May 10th and 11th. Um, our forum for that program for McNair is going to be May 26th and 27th. And then our Veterans Upper Bound proposal writing workshop is going to be June 8th and 9th. Um, and that one, too, again, for COE members, we encourage you to check your membership. When does it expire? And make sure that your membership is current by the time that, that these roll around. All right, Maureen, I think this is your slide on Student Support Services Grade. We're still getting here at COE a number of questions about um, grant aid um, and move if institutions have programs have money that is unspent. Um, can they move it into grant aid? Um, and the question, there's there's two questions here. Can you move money into from indirect cost? Uh, can you move money um, there, in the OMB circular? There's no limitation on moving money. Um, from uh, into grant aid, there is a limitation in, in 200.308 for moving it out of grant aid, but there is no, there's no requirement that, um, uh, that you move it, that when you move it out of into grant aid, that it be 
um, that it that you have permission. Um, the um, the many program specialists have taken the position that if you push, put money into grant aid, um, you have to maintain that um, throughout the entire um, five years of your grant. Certainly if you renegotiate your budget and get permission to renegotiate your budget and increase your grant, your, your line item, that is a requirement. However, the letter from uh, Dr. King did indicate that if you're using carryover money and putting that into grant aid, the CARES flexibility pro provides you that you can do that uh, without not carryover, um, no cost extension money. You can do that without permission of your program office. We wanna remind you again that the purchase, lease or rental of computer hardware, software, hotspots, all of that is allowable um, it is not equipment, so it does not require approval from your program specialist. I think that's it. And back to you, Jen. Okay. And um, we're going to switch now and talk about McNair stipend. So in the December 3rd letter that came from the Department of Education, the McNair program was highlighted um, and, and told, let me move my um, little window here so I can read our whole slide, and told that you may... Uh, submit a request to increase the amount of your stipend. Um, so this is a little excerpt from the letter here, the, uh, the underlying parts being the highlighted portions, entertain requests to increase the dollar amount of stipends during the academic and summer component. The request must be submitted to the project's program specialist. There is no specific dollar amount that has been decided, but all requests must be reasonable and necessary. So to think this through, find my, there was my cursor. Um, we go to the McNair regulations, right? So allowable costs highlight the, the use of stipends for McNair programs. The current allowable amount is up to $2,800 per student engaged in research internships provided the student has completed the sophomore year of study at an eligible institution before the internship begins. So if that's the part where you're saying you might have a lower stipend in your grant budget, um, but this is the minimum or the maximum, sorry, currently under, under your allowable costs. We also look to OMB uniform guidance that 200.404 for that term reasonable cost that they highlighted in this letter. So cost is reasonable in its nature. Sorry, a cost is reasonable if in its nature amount, it does not exceed that which would be incurred by a prudent person under the circumstances prevailing at the time the decision was made to incur the cost. When we hop down to C, we also look at the market prices for comparable goods or services in the geographical area. So that's another thing to consider. What are other students getting for stipends in similar programs when you're looking at setting that stipend amount or increasing that stipend amount? So this is our encouragement for you to really consider using this. We all know that our TRIO students can use more money at this time. If we can pay them a more reasonable rate um, for their internship experiences, those stipends are, are going to be very useful for them. So we encourage you to sketch out a plan. You're gonna to have to consult your budget. Do you have the money to be able to give extra? How many of your students will be able to apply for it? If every one of your students apply for it, would you be able to give them all the money that you got per, per, uh, permission to give them? Um, we encourage you to analyze comparison data. What are the other programs at your institution or neighboring institutions giving their summer research stipends or giving for summer research stipends? Um, what are other nonprofits in your area doing for internships? Um, make sure that you're looking at that to, to set your baseline of what you're going to apply for. And then set a reasonable amount. Um, we can't advise you what that is. It's very budget dependent for you, um, but we are here to help if you have any questions. When you're writing your request, obviously you're writing a formal business letter to your program officer. You want to make sure that you have your opening and your foundation, your ask. You want to have that justification. This is the comparisons that you gave, or this is the reasons why you're asking to increase the stipend to this amount. And then you want to have a formal closing. Remember, this is your documentation. Hopefully, they write back to you and say permission granted, right? It could be that easy, maybe, fingers crossed. Um, but this is your documentation of, of how you're justifying your request. So we, we want to encourage you to take it seriously, make sure that you're writing a nice formal letter and including all the relevant information to help your program officer make that um, determination that you should be approved, fingers crossed again, for your, um, your stipend increase. 
If you need support with this, um, we've heard about a lot of regional and state organizations that are having roundtables for programs, um, your peers at neighboring institutions, perhaps you met some folks at professional development opportunities that you can connect with. Um, really, your colleagues are going to be the ones that can help you navigate your unique situation the most. COE is always here to support you. I put our email addresses here in the case that you'd like us to um, read over a letter or give you some advice, um, but really, you know, connect with your peers, look to your state leaders. Um, if you need help connecting with your state leaders, you can let me know, drop me an email, I'll get you in touch with them. Um, but our community, this is the one of those places where our community is really stronger together and, and everyone's individual experiences can collectively inform um, the work that we're trying to do for our TRIO students. So we encourage you to look for that support where you need it. Um, before we take questions, so again, put your questions in the Q&A box. I have a couple of slides on some professional development opportunities. Um, starting early in March for college programs, the second and third, we do have new directors training, but I do want to let you know that it's not just for new directors. We also involve seasoned directors. Um, if you need a refresher, the changes um, and different things that you can learn or refresh yourself on um, to participate in that training. So the new directors training for college programs is March 2nd and 3rd. We do have a webinar for our McNair friends planning summer 2021 McNair stipends, internships, and research. Um, that is on March 30th. We have another um, really awesome webinar about engaging everyone in diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. That's on March 16th. And then our professional development department will tailor a training or a professional development workshop, a coaching session perhaps um, for your unique needs. So if you do want some sort of individualized support, please reach out to Angelica reach out to myself um, and we can let you know what our menu of offerings is and help create a professional development experience um, that meets the needs that you that you bring to us. I think we are at questions, Ms. Hoyler. Okay, uh, the first question is in the future, will IRS give actual numbers for transfer from IRS to the Department of Education? Um, I think this is what some actual numbers will be provided which actual numbers I think will be a question, um, but we'll try to keep you informed about that as the process for implementing the new FAFSA is developed. The second question is, I learned during priority one training that we could not use grant aid for this year. That's not true. So I'm not exactly sure what the question refers to. So if, if you could um, put some more information about that in your, uh, if you could put more information about that in your, um, in the chat or in the Q and A, that would be helpful. Okay, although the purchase of hotspots is allowable, do they have to be loaned to students or they can be given away and uh, permanently to students? I think it's important to understand that generally speaking, hotspots are supplies, okay? Um, they, the definition for equipment is uh, a useful life of more than one year and a cost, unless your institution has a, a lower cost of $5,000 or more. Um, so generally speaking with supplies, you give them to students. However, um, and, and probably more importantly, uh, for your own, how you run things. Um, well, there's an obligation of an, for the grantee, for the institution to track equipment that is purchased. There's no obligation for the institution to track supplies that are, per, are purchased. However, yeah, it may be in, it may be prudent um, to provide these to students as a loan um, with the expectation that they'll be returned, understanding that if they're not, um, that, that you have no obligation to go out and seize it or go out and prove that it, it, it was destroyed or whatever. Um, so, uh, that would be, you know, I think you, it's a question of prudence, how it's going to be viewed by others on, on your campus, how it's going to be viewed for students who don't have access to the hotspots. Uh, 
I think in, in general, this is a question of um, prudence. Kristen asked for the letter and Kristen, if you'll put your email in the uh, chat, we'll send you a copy of the letter. I should be organized enough to be able to put it on shared screen, but I'm not organized enough to be able to do that. So, um, Jen, are there other questions? Yeah, what is the difference between carryover and no cost extension money? If we have money left over because we did not travel or because we were online, did not use as many tutoring hours, can that money be moved to grant aid without permission? Okay, the difference between carryover and no cost extension is that um, the practical effect, there, there's no practical difference um, except that no cost extensions money is not typically authorized by the Department of Education and was only authorized for student support services using the COVID flexibilities. Carryover money is almost always an automatic authorization. The department sets a ceiling. Right now that ceiling is $30,000. In, in the middle from the first to the second, the second to the third, the third to the fourth, the fourth to the fifth year of your grant, you can carry that money over without any uh, approval. So um, the, the difference is that carryover applies to everything except the last year of the grant and no cost extension only applies to the last year of the grant. Um, can you read the, the um, last part of that question yes can that money if they didn't use money because they didn't travel or didn't have as many expenses can that money be moved to grant aid without permission in my opinion it can be moved to grant aid without permission um, there is a limitation that you can't um, move money from indirect costs to, to direct costs but grant aid is not an indirect cost you don't you don't charge it cost on it, uh, indirect cost on, um, you don't charge indirect costs on grant aid, but moving money into grant aid is not prohibited. All right. Without when, permission is not prohibited. Yeah. Okay. When do you think the McNair competition will open? Okay, look, if we look at this year, Talent Search EOC, um, opened, Talent Search opened in December. Um, Upward Bound, the initial open, the, the initial beginning of the cycle for Upward Bound is June 1st. So that means Upward Bound will come out before McNair. But I'd be prepared. Um, I would be planning in my head for a McNair uh, competition that was announced in December of 21. When it and comes to I, I say this, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a broken record on this. Um, all of the questions in the McNair uh, competition, except the possibility of the question about um, the competitive preference priorities, you already know they are what they are. So certainly by this spring, you want to be working on your application. You, that doesn't mean you, you need a, a draft by June, but you need to start working and thinking about getting support, identifying partners, uh, identifying mentors, all those things that you want to change, talking with your partners and your mentors and your students about things that you might want to add or subtract or change of what you're doing. Um, so please, uh, by the spring, I would think you would want to start doing that. When it comes to documentation, I get a lot of back and forth on when a signature is required. I've checked the legislation, but I still get pushback from institution or internal audits that we need signatures to verify services received, such as advising sessions, tutoring sessions, or attendance at events. Can you please confirm when a signature from a student is needed? It, it certainly is not required for every service that you provide. Okay, um, 
it's certainly required to determine eligibility. Um, and again, this is a question of reasonableness. When is it reasonable to, to, um, to document that you, you um, that a student participated in services? If you're, um, if you have a student who got one or two services, you know, that only saw you twice, that's one issue. If you have a student who's coming into tutoring every week and the tutor is, is filing a report on that tutoring, um, then you don't need a signature to document that because you have other information that you use to, to run your program um, to assure that, uh, to assure that you can show an auditor that you actually serve the person. If you have a class and the class, you have a study skills class and uh, uh, the, the person is on, the, the student is on that roster and gets a grade for that class, you don't need a signature every time that student comes in. So again, this is a, a reasonable question. Every time they come into an advising session, if the counselor keeps notes on what they talked about in the advising, that's as appropriate a documentation as the student's signature. But you don't want to be in a situation where, um, where there's, when somebody says, well, did Maureen Hoyler get any services from you? Um, that, that person was so non-served, didn't get intensive enough services that all the other records that you keep to advise and support Maureen Euler are not sufficient to document that she was served. Um, my best advice is keep good records that allow you to serve students well, and then you'll have plenty of, of documentation that the student was served. It's only when <laughs> that that's the, the best documentation is the documentation you have to keep just to make sure that you do the right thing by that student. But eligibility, you definitely have to have a, a statement uh, that's signed by the student or the parents that they're first generation um, and documentation, most often a financial aid form that shows what their tech, what their income is. Awesome, thank you. Uh, with regard to stipends for McNair, can we ask permission to request funding above twenty eight hundred dollars? Yes, that's what the that's what the last um, the last letter from the department allowed. But you can't just say, "Hey, can I? I want to pay them thirty six hundred dollars instead of twenty eight hundred dollars because they need the money." You have to show that the additional money is is related to additional expectations, um, whether that's appropriate or not, we're recommending that. That's not to say that, that some requests to increase stipends won't be approved uh, without it, but we're recommending that you really have a, a strong um, argument so that your program specialist can easily document why they approve that. It is, it is the COVID uh, flexibilities that are allowing the department to allow this increase in stipends because the stipend level is set by legislation. Okay, a grant aid question clarification. I already have a line item for grant aid. I know that I will have additional funds that are not direct costs at the end of this year. Am I allowed to add money to grant aid without one, having to commit that increased amount for two to three years? to ask for permission to move those funds from my program specialist and have to submit a modified budget for this current fiscal year. Yes, you're allowed to move it into that, that but if you do modify your budget, the practice of the, for one year, you know, you have, you have money that you can move into grant aid. But um, if, you, if you negotiated a change in your budget, then it, it stays that commitment continues throughout the five years of the cycle. 
Okay, there's a couple of statements that I could read for you, but that is all the questions. Okay, well, maybe I'll actually be able to read the statements myself. So <laughs> thanks everybody. Um, Krista, we will, uh, I, if, you, if we've got your email, we'll send you that letter. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Thanks.